afternoon and thank you all for joining us today. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this event hosted by Iceland Naturally and the Iceland Art Center. My name is Auður Jörnstóttir and I'm the director of the Iceland Art Center. Uh, with me here today are Markus Thor Andrésson, uh, Chief Curator at the Reykjavik Art Museum, Tina Rivers Ryan, Curator at the Albright Knox Museum, and Gregory Walk, uh, writer and curator. I want to thank them for taking the time for joining us today and share their insights into the Icelandic art scene. We will open up for questions at the end, so you are all welcome to post questions into the Q&A function. I hope you will all enjoy the talk. And now Tina will take over. Great, thank you so much, Otter, for the invitation to uh, be here today and to speak about Icelandic art, which is one of my um, new favorite subjects. Uh, as Otter mentioned, I am a curator at the Albright Knox Art Gallery in Buffalo, New York. And while I am not technically a curator of media art here, I do have a special interest in time-based media art, digital art. And for those of you who know um, a little bit about contemporary Icelandic art, you know that media and performance are among its major themes um, or its hallmarks. And as I understand it, I think this has something to do with the, um, the strong musical and literary traditions in Iceland, but perhaps that's something that Marcus can speak more about um, later. So uh, of course I've taken a particular interest in Icelandic art and I was actually lucky enough to make it over to Reykjavik in 2019. It was one of my last trips. It was actually my last international trip before COVID um, to attend the Sequences Festival there. Um, and uh, Sequences was started in 2006 by some of the leading arts institutions there. If you have had the chance to watch the new series of videos that have been organized about the Icelandic art scene, um, if, uh, you might recall that uh, Doro Kirch talks about Sequences, I think, in the third episode of those videos. Um, but the subtitle of Sequences is Real Time Art Festival. And that's because it you know, was really founded to promote media art and, um, and sort of the time-based arts. And actually just before we started this, uh, this panel, I was speaking with the Icelanders who confirmed that in fact, Sequences was the very first visual arts festival in Iceland. And I think it's incredibly telling about the nature of Icelandic art that their first visual arts festival was in fact one devoted to media art. Um, and so what you're seeing here on the screen uh, was a musical performance from the opening night of Sequences um, at Marshall House, which also is a space that was mentioned in those videos. Um, and this particular artist, uh, I'm gonna try to pronounce her name correctly, Thorana Björnstatter, um, had a fantastic um, live musical performance that was broadcast through headphones. I enjoyed it very much. And it turns out that she's actually curating the next edition of Sequences, which will be this fall. Um, so, you know, uh, pandemic willing. Um, so um, the, uh, the uh, focus in Icelandic art on, on temporality, on performance, on media is nothing new. It goes back to at least the 1960s when the Icelandic artist Stena helped pioneer the, video, uh, the field of video art. Stena, um, I'm just gonna briefly introduce you to her because I don't think you can talk about Icelandic art with talking about Stena. Um, although of course I'm a bit biased. So Stena trained as a musician and then married the filmmaker Woody Vasilka and they moved to New York City. And together they made many early experiments with video technologies and even uh, co-founded the space The Kitchen in New York City, which remains one of the most important spaces for avant-garde art. Um, in the 1970s, Stena and Woody actually lived and taught here in Buffalo. And I'm proud to say that in 1978, the Albert Knox Art Gallery, where I'm a curator, hosted what I believe was their first museum show. Um, and so you see here a photo of this incredible installation and we have these amazing archival photos. And you can see that basically uh, this work called Machine Vision comprised a mirrored ball in the middle of the room that had two uh, cameras, like closed circuit TV cameras pointing at it, which then fed live images to the monitors at the perimeter of the room. So essentially this work is establishing some of the major themes that we will see in early video art, um, including liveness uh, and the openness or indeterminacy of the work of art. So including the audience as part of the work so that the image will continually evolve. Um, and also perceptual confusion or disorientation, and finally surveillance. So Stena is a hugely important um, artist uh, in the history of video art, and also, um, I think, you know, one of the um, 
uh, like most emblematic of Icelandic contemporary uh, artists. So when I was in Reykjavik attending sequences, I did have the chance to conduct some studio visits, um, including one with Finboy Peterson, who is an artist who works with light and sound. And you see here one of his installations at the Reykjavik Art Museum's Harbor House. So this is just to say that, you know, the, the interest that Stena um, it, uh, represents definitely continued through contemporary Icelandic art. Uh, here you see another installation, and I apologize the image is a bit um, low quality, but here's another installation by Finboy called Surveillance. And of course, with these cameras in a circle facing each other, I can't help but think of Stena's machine vision. And I'm not sure if it was an intentional homage, but um, uh, I do like to think of these as being in conversation. And then uh, the last artist I want to talk about briefly to sort of get our conversation about Icelandic art going is Oliver Eliasson. So, um, of course, art that deals with temporality almost necessarily deals with perception. And so perception is another major theme in Icelandic art. Um, and in uh, Oliver's work, we see how perception for Icelanders is so intimately tied to the landscape. Um, you know, Iceland is obviously um, an incredible landscape that's quite severe and beautiful. You have the black lava fields, you have the steaming lagoons, you have the aurora borealis. Um, and Iceland is also, you know, geologically quite young. I mean, it looks sort of um, primordial, but it's actually very young land and it's still forming. And so I think a lot of Icelandic art has something to do with what it means to be situated inside of a changing landscape, um, thinking about landscape either literally or just sort of metaphorically. And at the Albert Knox, we have a significant collection of works by the Danish Icelandic artist, um, Olafur Eliasson. And I'm showing you here a series of photos from 1998 that really captures the experience of being inside the landscape. So here you're literally inside of these caves, looking out at various atmospheric conditions. Um, of course, many of Eliasson's works are about exactly this, about experiencing yourself, experiencing changing atmospheric conditions. So here's another work from our collection from 2004, which is a motorized kinetic sculpture that activates the darkened room with lights and shadows. And conceptually, it's quite simple, but phenomenologically, it's really complex and, and beautiful and kind of haunting. It's like one of my favorite works um, in our collection. And so finally, I'll just wrap up by saying that, you know, uh, well, as some of you may know, um, perhaps not all of you, here in Buffalo, we are currently in the midst of a major expansion on our campus, which will add a third building and also double our exhibition space. Uh, and as part of this project, which we call AK360, we are currently working with uh, Eliasson and Sebastian Bayman of Studio Other Spaces um, to create this artwork called Common Sky that will essentially cover over the courtyard of our 1962 building that was designed by Gordon Budshaft of SOM. So we're incredibly excited about working with him on this um, and, and about bringing this work to Buffalo. And we hope that it will be a prelude to further collaborations with Icelandic artists. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Marcus. Thanks, Tina. And thank you everybody for being with us and, and thanks for your interest in uh, good old Iceland. <laughs> We are here in Reykjavik. I'm sitting in the Reykjavik Art Museum where I hold the position of uh, Chief Curator of Exhibitions and Public Engagement. I've been here for around five years. And, and before that, I've been curating and writing independently and working on documentaries and TV shows on contemporary art, all in all working quite a lot with Icelandic artists and within the Icelandic art, art scene and, and abroad. And uh, um, just for introduction's sake, like you're doing, Tina, just a, a couple of slides to, to get things going. And, you know, in so many places, uh, not only in Iceland, contemporary art is, is uh, owing a lot to the avant-garde of the 60s and 70s. And I think it's great that Tina started out by mentioning key figures such as Steina and the Rizulkas, who have had a major influence on, on the development of new media art. So I'd also like to mention other major representatives of different uh, avant-garde movements who have contributed to the scene that we know today. So um, mentioning Errol here uh, with his foodscape from 1964, somebody who has uh, quite a lot of influence. Uh, he is uh, turning 90 next year. So we're gonna celebrate uh, his birthday with a huge uh, retrospective here at the museum, traveling show that's gonna go from here to Moscow and, and then to Denmark and, and who knows where. Uh, his art is, you know, based in pop art and narrative figuration, appropriation. So it's like very postmodern. Uh, Hreden Fridfinsson, 
who is uh, on our next slide uh, has uh, is an excellent example of, of the conceptual art movement how it how it traveled to Iceland it uh, took a very poetic streak uh, he is also thinking about nature and landscape but in a, in a very different way from his predecessors who were you know painting landscape he's more thinking about how he experiences art how he positions how he, how he positions himself in nature so uh, Friedrichson, a very important key figure in from from the 60s and 70s uh, Magnus Paulsson, I bring him in just as an example of uh, how Fluxus played a huge role in the Icelandic art scene. This was uh, partly through through the influence of uh, Dieter Roth, who lived here extensively in Iceland, and um, uh, so Magnus Paulsson was influenced by him and and uh, and con continued to work in this Fluxus-oriented uh, practice, process, language, theatre, performance. And then finally, Ruri, a veteran of uh, performance art and and uh, sort of uh, yeah, somebody who, who really started uh, focusing on social critique, and uh, and all these uh, artists and many more, they represent movements which which are, are very important to to the art scene as we know it today, and um, we can talk about uh, just a couple of uh, artists who are working internationally who draw a lot from this uh, generation, such as uh, Ragnar Kjartansson, obviously who is you know taking on postmodern appropriation process performance and. So he's an artist who's fundamentally a driving force in in in, uh, in analyzing or, or deconstructing the you know the making of and the reception of art, uh, be it visual arts or or music or theater or, or film or television or literature, like in this work uh, in particular, World Live, where he's referencing a a novel by Halldór Laxness, a major project commissioned by by TVA Twenty One, and then uh, another artist working internationally who's I'd like to mention is, is Katrin Sigurðardóttir, who works in, on sculpture and installation, and, and, and here's a, an artist who's working with uh, conceptual ideas um, on the perception of time and distance, memory and space, uh, merging beautifully the notion of the local and the global and the personal and the general. So uh, it's very much in the spirit of these poetic uh, conceptual works uh, that I mentioned before. Here's a work that she, she did for the Metropolitan Museum where she's sort of redesigning a, a room that's on display there. So there's a lot of great artists that uh, I could mention and, and uh, they, they work with and, and uh, use a lot of these ideas that come from the 60s and in the 70s, but uh, uh, to cut a, a long story short, I also have to turn things, on, things around because um, uh, it's uh, Icelandic art. You cannot talk about it without talking about the influence that comes from abroad. Uh, this is like I mentioned, Dieter Roth coming here in the 60s had a huge influence and there were so many artists that came from internationally who to, to study here or to teach here or to collaborate with Icelandic artists to study the Icelandic landscape. They just may have gotten a cheap ticket with Iceland there crossing over the Atlantic Ocean, stopping by, you know, for five days or something. But all this had a big influence on the scene here. People are always thirsty for something new. And this um, conversation, this dialogue between the Icelandic and the international art scene is is very important and, and still is. Um, so uh, we try to maintain this tradition here in the museum. We have a, like a, a venue for younger upcoming artists and, and we try to include the international artists who drift up north and, and study here in the MA program of the Icelandic Art Academy. So we have a series of uh, upcoming artists showing in this uh, D gallery series. We have uh, done this since the 2007 and, and uh, we have more than 40 artists taking part and Andreas Brunner also in this case from Switzerland uh, a great uh, a great example of uh, an international artist who is settling here in Iceland and, and making a big influence on the on the scene here uh, another project we're working on here in the museum upcoming for for the summertime is a, is a big show of, of maybe the next generation a bit older people in the 30s and early 40s people who have uh, sort of fallen in between worlds you know partly analog partly digital so we're trying to look at uh, 14 artists from this generation uh, here in Iceland who have uh, witnessed, you know, two, two worlds. And Arna Ottarsdóttir is, is an example of this, who is, you know, going back to uh, old traditions of craft and textiles while being very firmly in her digital contemporary art uh, environment, as you can see in this uh, in this great example. Uh, recent uh, work by her and then I wanted to mention um, if we go a, a generation up we have a, a series of um, uh, 
like uh, retrospectives or mid-career retrospectives, and and this is the artist we're working with now in the fall, Guðni Rosa Ingimarsdóttir, an excellent example of of uh, a person who is working very much in her with her hands, uh, very much appropriating stuff, uh, copy paste a little bit, uh, taking from Arrow, but also the poetic side from Shet Friðfinnsson, and uh, the uh, crafty work of the 60s and 70s. Uh, very poetic, very subtle. We look forward to doing this show with her in the, in the fall. And uh, finally, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the project we're working on uh, next year, which is a, an international collaboration. This is a, a project we're, uh, with a working title, North Atlantic Triennial. And uh, this is a show opening in, in Portland Museum of Art in Maine, early 2022. That's going to travel here to Iceland and then moving over to Sweden, Bildmuseet in Umeå. And uh, this is a, a project that aims to create a new kind of center based around the North Atlantic region or the Arctic region, where we are uh, taking in artists who are looking at the changes that are happening in society and nature and climate uh, with a very personal uh, story to tell. And Anna Lindahl is one of those people who's been studying the way scientists are researching the changes happening in our nature. And she does it very much in her, in her own style. So. Here's just a couple of examples of artists uh, that I wanted to uh, throw out there for, for conversation later. And of course, I'm, I'm missing out on, on a bunch of great artists, but you know how it is. We can't include everybody at the same time. So over to you, Gregory. Hi. Hi uh, to everybody. And it's wonderful that you're here. Um, and I'm pleased to be here um, as well. Uh, it so happens that in this pandemic time, my very first trip outside of the United States is going to be to none other than Reykjavik uh, in just a couple weeks, uh, and where I will go to write about two exhibitions. The one group show that Marcus just talked about at the Reykjavik Art Museum, and uh, the next one by the artist that, whose work you can see here now, Ragnar Robertsdotter. But first, just like a little brief, uh, I'm an art writer, uh, an occasional curator based in New York City, writing for Hyperallergic, long time for Art in America, uh, and many other, uh, many other things. But every now and then, it's been my experience that one or I have been favored to experience in the art world because of the art world, life-changing things. And for me, my first trip uh, to Iceland in 1999 was one of those trips. I landed in Keflavik and felt curiously oddly at home in a completely alien, bizarre landscape for me, like Mars with oxygen. Uh, but it felt it just so good and right to be there. I, I, I went to Reykjavik to write a catalog essay about Ragnar Robertsdotter, who you see here now. And I also got one of the few times I've gotten a great idea. I also got uh, an idea to combine this uh, catalog essay with writing a big article for Art in America, a survey of contemporary art then. So while I was in Reykjavik for over two, uh, two different times in, in uh, August and uh, November, I had 30 or 40 studio visits, which was just so wonderful, resulting um, in that article. So Ragnar Robert's daughter works with what Jane Bennett has called in her great book, uh, uh, Vibrant Matter, Vital Materialities. She works with, this might look like a painting for those of you who don't know her work, but it's actually lava. It's lava chips uh, on, glued to the wall. And she makes these works by mapping out a section of of the, of the wall and just flinging, flinging handfuls of lava at it. Much of it sticks, some of it falls. Uh, and then she sometimes uses tweezers to just like, just slowly, patiently uh, de develop the whole work. In the meantime, she's working with traces of whopping forces, the volcanoes, which are not right now erupting quite a lot. Uh, in, in in Iceland and and uh, the reason I, I went there I realized I could not write about her adequately without going with her out uh, to the landscapes that matter so much to her that mean so much to her so I went on a studio visit say to Hecla the famous volcano uh, and, and way out to the highlands 
Okay, next, uh, next slide. In more recent works by her, once again, extremely elemental as she's just working with ocean salt or black lava salt, glass, water, and she can't totally control how these works look because she just makes this event uh, and the water evaporates and what's left is the image. I love it, it's like uh, molecular, it's cosmic. Uh, and, and just she, she's, uh, she's so connected to working like with the vital materials of her, of her country, working, not making uh, representations of nature, landscape painting, but working with the land itself. And that's one thing I've totally seen and what's so important uh, is how significant the Icelandic nature, volatile Icelandic landscape is for, for so many artists there. And by the way, also for me, I'm proud to report that I've twice hiked the backpack to the world famous Leugaveger Trail. Uh, and I've also been backpacking in one of the most remote parts of Iceland, which is Hornstrandir in the, in the Northwest. So the Icelandic nature is very important extremely important uh, to me as it is to this fantastic artist in her early 70s who deserves much greater recognition. She has it in Iceland and a lot in Europe, but in my opinion, much more. She, there's, some, there's a visionary artist working with nature in this way. Okay, next. When I was in Reykjavik for my very first time, I met so, Birga Andresson, who is a, who is a legendary figure. I think that Marcus would agree with me about this. Uh, an incredibly important, excellent artist working in, in many different uh, genres and medium uh, and who died way too early. I'm convinced that Birger Andersson, had he left Iceland, uh, and made his career in, in uh, another, you know, much more visible place, Germany or uh, continental Europe or the United States, I'm convinced he would be understood to be one of the great artists of the era. But he didn't make a mistake because Iceland was his home and it was both his subject and muse. Uh, 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 so he needed Iceland. And, and so he worked in many different ways, including these text pieces, but they have a certain, a certain fascinating history. He was born on, uh, in the Westman Islands, which is off the south coast of Iceland and grew up as a sighted person in a home for the blind. So his blind father and blind stepmother. So from an early age, he was explaining the world in precise, vivid terms uh, to them. And, and th this, that, that acuity with language, that precision is exactly what would come into his, uh, his, his language portraits later. Okay, next slide. And also he, Marcus could talk a, a more about this later, but he, he also, Birka Andresen also had a real sense of humor. And he, so he invented his own sort of like fake color scheme, Pantone color system, in which he named specific colors as, as like absolutely Icelandic colors. Although of course those colors could be anywhere. And he gave them names, but such great names. For example, as you see here, pouring rain, blackest night. It's like, the, it's like in these two, these two wall paintings, it's like, creates an entire scene, a very Icelandic scene. It could be the beginning of a saga. Uh, it's totally connected to nature. And even though th th there's something very humorous about taking this kind of black or this kind of green, greenish color and saying it's specifically Icelandic, I mean, of course it's not, but if, when you're in Iceland, you realize that these colors are very much connected to Iceland, including the outside of the corrugated, the corrugated outsides of houses in the old uh, part of Reykjavik and many other places throughout the country. Okay, next slide. And what, this is what's something that's fascinating to me, maybe also because I'm from the US, but like the, uh, the US art scene is actually really connected in, in fundamental ways with Iceland and it, because some of the really great artists uh, from the last several decades 
were deeply engaged with Iceland. Donald Judd, for example, Lawrence Wiener, for example. None more so than Ronnie Horn, who started going to Iceland as soon as she graduated from Yale, if not before, and who's been going back repeatedly, deeply understands the country, has influenced her enormously. And this is, I'm showing just one image of, of her great, great work called Library of Water in the west part of Iceland, in the West Fjord, in Stickesholmer. And it, 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 there's 24 glass cylinders filled with water from Iceland's melting glaciers, a work uh, way back then, 2007, which is very much responding to Iceland in, in a time of global warming and crisis. Uh, there's words on the floor which people have given that refer to the weather, the weather being something crucial for Ronnie Horn. Uh, and when you're there, there's something, it's also something so magical because it's a little town and outside is the giant water, the giant ocean. So you're looking through water at water and as light slants through these columns. Uh, so so the, 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 the impact of Iceland on Ronnie Horn, but also on so many other artists um, is crucial. Okay, I'll end with that. Thank you so much. Uh, and now we can talk together. Okay. What, uh, so I just have a quick question. Oh, do, oh, do you wanna say something about Birga first, Marcus? No, well, thank you just for, for your great presentation. I mean, these are these are excellent examples. I, I, I totally get where you're coming from with this. And, and Birgit is somebody who we are very much admire. And and, uh, and I could just add that we are working on a, on a big show of his work uh, coming up next year and curated by Robert Hobbs. And it's going to be followed by a, a, a nice uh, substantial catalog. So we look very much forward to that. And uh, I worked, uh, I did work with him on several occasions when he was alive. And, and uh, you're absolutely right. He's, he's a key figure here in Iceland because he's dealing with national identity, national heritage, but uh, not in this nationalistic way, but in this humorous sort of quirky deconstructing way that, that uh, is a very, you know, basic case study that could apply anywhere in the world, you know, taking, taking what you get from your ancestors which is either overlooked or scorned or, or or maybe praised you know hysterically too much and putting it on a level where where things are you know human and understandable did that beautifully great okay so i have a question for everyone just to get us talking um why, what, why should, uh, say, North Americans, uh, it could be from anywhere, but why should North Americans, what might North Americans, uh, art enthusiasts, museum people, anyone like that, ha might have to learn from art produced in Iceland? And by the way, Iceland does not have a, a, a long history in terms of visual art. Maybe Marcus could, uh, but art, art in Iceland is, is, is essentially a 20, a close to a 20th century enterprise for a lot of complex reasons. But what might we have to learn uh, or to, to, from, from art produced in this small, small but powerful country of 350,000 people or so? I mean, there's more artists in my neighborhood in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, than probably more visual artists than in all of Iceland. So what what could we possibly have to learn? And that the second part of that question is like, why are the two of you, myself included, so engaged with Iceland? What's important, unique about the art from this country? Well, I, it's difficult when you're in the midst of the a storm, but but judging from from uh, you know raising children at least you can you can see something happening there that it's just the right conditions and you don't necessarily create those conditions they happen accidentally and i think what happened to the icelandic art scene when it was developing that it had the appropriate amount of uh, uh, disinterest uh, you know disinterestedness people were not interested <laughs> they didn't uh, you know, the artists were allowed to just run their own uh, art, uh, artist-run business and doing art for each other. They were not doing it for the market. They were not doing it for, you know, the critics. It was just a very self-contained scene for a very uh, long time, maybe for the, exactly the appropriate amount of time. And this just created a very, very fertile ground. And, and, and as I said, in my introduction, I think we have to 
uh, sort of nod to those uh, generations of people who, who paved the way with uh, you know doing their thing for you know zero interested people and and uh, you know the museums didn't collect their works uh, they weren't bought they weren't shown uh, so these people who, who the avant-garde artists, artists who, who had this time to play around and then they had the this over to the next generation, which has then a certain kind of freedom that maybe is uh, on a different level than you have in other societies. And this is, as I say, it's, it's difficult to repeat this. This is just something that happened and this wouldn't happen today. I mean, here in Iceland, we have a perfect art uh, university. We have uh, published our art history. We have uh, we have galleries, international galleries. We have collectors and we have museums and God knows what. And we're just like, you know, any other town in Sweden for that matter. So, you know, it's, it's just, a point in time where the situation was uh, uh, good. And then another point that you take is, is the environment. Like uh, Tina was saying, Oliver Eliasson mentions it, that it's the changing land landscape that has an influence. And I, I guess I have to, as much as it's a cliche for us here in Iceland, it's, 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 there is a truth to it. The changing weather, the changing landscape, the changing, you know, there's a freaking volcanic eruption here outside my window. So, you know, this, these changes, they do have an influence on how you perceive, how you connect with your environment. And I guess to a certain extent, this is what, what comes through uh, the artwork that we see. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and you know, to Gregory's question, I think that that's actually one reason, like that's one answer to the question of why Icelandic art might be interesting to people who are outside of Iceland. It's the relationship, the sort of understanding of ecology and the relationship to the landscape. I mean, in this moment of extreme climate change, when we are all having to think in a much more deliberate way about our relationship to the environment. And we're talking about things like the Anthropocene and, and trying to understand how we ourselves can, um, both on a personal level and a societal level, reimagine our relationship to nature, understanding that, that there's actually an, an imperative to do that or we're not gonna survive as a species. I think in Iceland, I mean, as you said, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a cliche, but there's some truth to it. I mean, you're literally living under an exploding volcano right now, which just seems like this amazing, I mean, it has nothing to do with climate change, but it's this amazing, very concrete um, uh, representation of what it means to be living in a climate that is in some ways sort of inhospitable and hostile. Um, and, and, you know, the way that artists can sort of open our eyes to seeing that landscape around us and to learn how to, to sort of live with it, to find beauty in it. Um, I just think that there's a model there that we all could be looking towards. So, um, mm -hmm. and then Gregory, for the second part of your question, it was why we individually are interested in Iceland yeah. or Icelandic like art. What? Yeah, why are, why are we all here? <laughs> That's something. No, that like we... what made you, what drew you to Iceland originally? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think I tried to already sort of answer this um, when I was trying to give that sort of art history 101 overview to like what exactly are the major themes and movements within contemporary Icelandic art. Um, but yeah, for me, it's it's really the media. I mean, I just, um, I'm, you know, very drawn. Like when you think of, okay, well, who are the sort of major contemporary Icelandic artists that, you know, most people in the art world could name? They're all people who work with, um, with time, with perception, and those are absolutely just personally my interests. Um, it was only when I got to Iceland that I understood that actually there's also, um, I'm also very sympathetic to a kind of mood there. Like Marcus was mentioning, there's a sense of humor in Icelandic art, mm -hmm. but Icelandic art is also very metal. <laughs> like, like, you know, sort of like goth and like very intense and kind of romantic. Like there's a lot of interest in the sublime, like some of these notions um, still pertain there. But at the same time, there's also um, this attitude of sort of like not taking oneself too seriously and being very playful. And I love that, those sort of two poles of, of um, you know, being very open to like uh, these sort of existential questions and uh, to, to, to the notion of the sublime uh, and then also, you know, making wordplay. Uh, so, mm -hmm. and it's again, that's something that I didn't, like the mood, I didn't quite understand until I got there and started speaking with artists and, and myself understood the landscape mm -hmm. and being, having your first visit to Iceland in October, I feel like is kind of the perfect time, actually. <laughs> like it was a bit gray, it was a bit cold, it was a bit wet, it was a bit, um, yeah, a bit dramatic. Uh, so uh, yeah, so those would be my answers to those questions, which are great questions. But this, this point you're making, Tina, is, is something that uh, is interesting because it comes from, you know, the, the visitor's eye and, and uh, mm. 
just recently we, have, we were publishing a, a magazine of Icelandic art just for, for the local art scene and, and there was an article in there by a, a, a young artist, a woman from France, Claire Pogam, who was uh, asking this question about the playfulness in Iceland. I mean, she just comes like you from abroad and sees what hap what's happening and she immediately jumps on this. Why is Icelandic art so playful? What's, you know, why, why don't they take themselves more seriously? It's, it's playful in the sense of, of uh, you know, throwing things out there that are maybe uh, not completely finished. It's, it's raw. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, childish, naive, funny in that sense. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, slapstick. Um, and uh, it uh, maybe avoids, it, it, maybe to some extent, it, it avoids uh, clear references to uh, serious subjects. Uh, issues uh, of the day or, or such. So this is something that she noted in, in her article. And I, I find it interesting that, that, that you also mentioned this. Hmm. It is interesting. But one thing I would also add, and this gets a little like risky, uh, is that in, in my experience, I don't mean to sum up all of Icelandic art. I mean, that's like ridiculous. But, but I think that there's something in the art that I cherish from Iceland, there's something very um, soulful and oftentimes frankly emotional, like not shying away from frankly being that frankly emotive, uh, emotionally engaged work uh, in, in the work itself, but also the artist. That's certainly what I experienced meeting Birger Andresen and Ragnar Robesutter and Ragnar Kjartansson uh, or, or Janssi. Uh, there, there's, there's this, this ability to deal in like core level complicated human matters and emotions in a sophistic sophisticated way with art and I'll just like have one like brief little story of, of like a while ago Ragnar Kjartansson had this fantastic exhibition probably many every who's on many of you who are on this zoom talk saw the visitors I, I, uh, either at Loring Augustine or wherever you saw it. And so I wrote about that exhibition for amazing exhibition for art, art in America. Uh, and I, I think I went like three or four times taking the whole 64 minutes or more. Uh, it's so mean. And then I finally fin I finished my text and sent it off. And I was like, well, I'm just going to go back one more time because I'm going to miss this show. And so I went back and it had been extended uh, at, um, at the gallery. And so, so I went back, I took one step into the gallery and burst into tears in a completely involuntary way. I wasn't expecting this to happen at all. This doesn't usually happen uh, for me uh, as an art writer who's seen hundreds of exhibitions, but it certainly happened then. And I think it's because of the, this soulfulness and this, this depth of this emotional, uh, intensity uh, 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 of, of the work, which of that great work, which is humorous, which is whoppingly sad, which is cosmic, uh, 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 which is tender, <laughs> all, of, all of these things at the same time. And I think that's a quality and in in, in, in that soulfulness is something that I very much responded to. Tina, you also mentioned Finboy Peterson. Uh, that's, he's exactly like that for me. I think I was trying to use the word romantic, but to describe exactly what you're saying, and maybe soulful is the better word, but there's, yeah, yeah there's a sense of, um, you know, being willing to experience emotions and, and um, yeah, and to sort of inhabit them. And I wonder actually if, you know, in the wake of this pandemic, and it feels very premature to say wake when you consider what's going on right now around the world. Yeah, but good point. Um, but if we can imagine at some point there will be a future in which the great reckoning will happen and we will have to think about, you know, not only like, oh, what has the art world meant, uh, or what has the pandemic meant for the art world, but just what has the pandemic meant for you know, like human civilization and all of us sort of processing what it's been like to live through this moment, like this world historical moment. Um, I wonder if art that can accommodate these kinds of um, sort of big feelings will feel even more sort of relevant um, and, and urgent. So anyway, that was just one thought I had thinking about what you yeah. said, but um, I, speaking of um, COVID, now that I've brought that up, I actually, um, um, Marcus, I love how you mentioned like the, the cheap Iceland air flights. 
um, that we sort of facilitate this like cross-cultural exchange. And that just got me thinking about this moment in which so many of us have been grounded. So um, for example, I was supposed to go back to Iceland. So I was in, in Iceland for sequences in October of 2019. And then I was supposed to go back in April of 2020 to do some more studio visits, which I was very much looking forward to. And then that trip of course got canceled because of COVID and hopefully, you know, I'll be able to make it back and, um, and, and make that happen at some point. But, um, you know, what do you think, I'm just curious, I mean, being an island country, um, now that so much of the art world is talking about shifting away from art fairs um, and shifting away from international travel, partly because of the ecological cost and shifting instead towards digital events and digital mm. sales, um, what impact do you think that might, that might have on on Iceland's art scene, given that so much of it has been dependent upon the sort of cheap and frequent, uh, mm. you know, transoceanic travel. Well, I do think that uh, you know times are different. You know, today we have uh, our our society is so much more mixed than it was before, and we have so many people just living here on a permanent basis from from everywhere. So we have a huge uh, just influx that's that's steady at the moment on stuck on the island. So we do have uh, shows coming up from uh, minority groups that are uh, very you know interesting and and upcoming people who were who were have settled here in Iceland and, and made Iceland their home. So this is something that, that continues to inspire the country and, and be seen. And uh, so you don't necessarily need, need to have the constant in and out travel of people, but uh, you can also create projects that can travel. And we here at the museum are trying to do that, uh, to, to create exhibitions that can go abroad and internationally and, and you know, vice versa, try to have uh, connections and, and, and uh, professional uh, relationships with institutions on, on, on collaborative projects that can that can happen. Uh, I mean, this project I mentioned before, the, the North Atlantic Triennial, we haven't, you know, we haven't met at all. We haven't met any artists. We're just doing it online and it's, it's working fine. And, well, let's let's wait and see until the show opens. But at least I think it's possible to, to do this like that. And uh, I think uh, there are just different ways about things today. And, and uh, I know people are uh, preparing shows uh, internationally without being able to travel and, and it's, it's going fine. And, and I'm sure you have uh, similar stories to tell in your situations. Mm -hmm. Does the museum have, do you have a lot of um, relationships with museums outside of Iceland? Well, it's uh, sort of uh, co coming along. I, I guess the COVID the pandemic sort of <clears throat> Uh, kicked us in the ass uh, in that uh, sense to think more about that. I mean, we have been focusing quite a lot on, on the local scene just with the programming that's going on this year. But um, behind the scenes, we're trying to uh, increase our relationship uh, internationally just to be able to, you know, when everything is, uh, is, is over and done with, uh, <laughs> with the situation, we can, we can uh, start collaborating and, and opening up to projects that will come in and, and leave us and go, other, go to other places. So hopefully that's, uh, that's uh, a positive thing that might come out of this. I'll just briefly interject here to remind everyone who's um, listening along that we are happy to take some questions, um, especially not since you have uh, Marcus here with you uh, and also Gregory and both of these people being, you know, very much embedded in Icelandic art. <laughs> Um, so if you guys want to use the Q&A feature to ask any questions, um, we're happy to tackle those. Otherwise, we could just keep talking. We've been doing this now for a couple months and we could keep going. Um, I know, for example, that one thing that we've been chewing over is the, the kind of paradox of thinking about Icelandic art as an entity, as you know, a construction, when in fact so much of contemporary art now has become globalized. And is now about kind of moving beyond nationalistic borders and boundaries, um, you know, for myriad reasons. And we can debate whether or not that's a good thing, but yeah, to, to be talking about Icelandic art in a way seems sort of like perversely um, uh, old fashioned. And so I just wondered if we could, we could all talk a little bit more about that. I'm curious to know, you know, both Marcus and Gregory, what your thoughts are. Um, I Maybe do agree that. The <clears throat> sorry, yeah. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. No, it's it's definitely something that uh, if you talk to Icelandic artists, they're all pretty much uh, afraid of this uh, um, stamp uh, of the Icelandic 
artists and and the cliche of the well loving nature and and being inspired by nature and and uh, being drunk all the time and and not being able to express emotions unless in, in in your artwork and whatnot but again the cliche is oftentimes based on a certain truth and uh, people play with this cliche also they they you know put on an act and and uh, and uh, this is something that the future generations will probably continue to deconstruct and play with i mean uh, we talked about birgit in the beginning who was uh, doing nothing but uh, breaking down cliches and and uh, and making fun of uh, such ideas of something being icelandic by by choosing icelandic typically icelandic colors so it's uh, similarly ridiculous to talk about typically icelandic artists i guess but uh, maybe through through the eye of the of somebody who, who comes from from afar and then sees the art scene there are uh, elements that uh, are repeated like we've been talking about the playfulness you know nature and a certain kind of humor and 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 then of course there's a, a range of uh, things that break those rules and do something completely different and uh, we would never be probably categorize them as typically Icelandic they're more uh, in line with uh, internationally and international art scene in some senses and speaking of that Gregory I don't want to preempt you answering this question but one of the questions that has come in is about galleries in New York City or the U.S. that promote Icelandic artists and they mentioned Luring Augustine representing Ragnar Kjartansson so also I want to mention Tanya Banakdar representing um uh, Oliver Eliasson, and also there are um, amazing galleries in Iceland that I have encountered many times at art fairs as well as in Reykjavik. So I8 Gallery and Berg Contemporary are two galleries that come to mind. And so they're based in Iceland, but they, you know, I mean, we'll see what the art world looks like after COVID, but at least before COVID, you know, they would bring works um, to fairs regularly. I saw an amazing installation by I8 of work by Woody Vasilka, um, uh, at um, the Armory show, actually. Um, so, you know, they're, they're sort of bringing artists who are um, Icelandic or Icelandic adjacent um, to international attention. Um, another quish, uh, question that came in that I just um, wanted to um, highlight real quick here, because I'm curious to know more about um, what Marcus and Gregory would have to say to this. The question is, what are the major socio-political themes that new generation artists are grappling with in Iceland? And I, I wanted to draw out this question because it actually relates to something that came up earlier, but I didn't follow up on. So Marcus, when you were saying that this other you know, woman who was looking at Iceland from the outside said that you know, the work is very playful and sort of maybe doesn't tackle you know, these, these troubling issues, I made a little face because I was thinking in my mind of being in Reykjavik and seeing all of the art that was basically about the 2008 financial crisis and the housing crisis, like artists who are working with corrugated steel, um, artists who are making drawings of abandoned, um, you know, homes that were, you know, left mid construction when, you know, Iceland got hit terribly hard in that crisis. So um, if you just wanted to answer this question, I'd be curious to know what are some of the major themes that artists are dealing with? I know for myself, I saw that sort of international finance and the vulnerability of Iceland within the international global financial community was something that I noticed. Yeah, you're spot on there, Tina. That's a, that was a big issue at the time, and and cert certainly many many artists uh, took part in that uh, whole uh, discourse. Uh, prior to that, in in the, in the first decade of the, this century, I'd say artists had a huge impact on the uh, discourse around uh, uh, how we are dealing with our nature in terms of uh, either protect protecting it uh, for future generations or making some sort of use of it. And in this case in particular, there was the question of, uh, of flooding a huge uh, highland area to create a hydroelectric power plant. And uh, when it came to discussing this, uh, the public was uh, pretty much uh, oblivious about this because people hadn't gone there, they hadn't seen these parts, and then the artists uh, took it on themselves to go up there, to take people up there, to, to make uh, photographs, to, to send photographic, uh, photographers up there and, and uh, to really make the public aware of this. So they really changed the discourse, I must say, a huge influence there. Uh, the, the financial crash, that was true. And then there is this um, uh, critique on the, on the society as it is constructed today. I mean, it is in, in many senses stagnant. Uh, it is old fashioned. It is uh, uh, 
pretty much focused on the local. We are very new to uh, how to deal with immigrants and, and people from uh, from uh, other uh, areas of the world living here with us. These are all upcoming issues that you see brewing with younger artists. Uh, how are we tackling uh, situations uh, like class? We've always sort of prided ourselves here in Iceland that there's no class system. Everybody's equal. And uh, artists are taking part in sort of deconstructing that myth and uh, you know pointing to the obvious that uh, we have as much a class system here as anywhere else, if not more. It's just hidden in different ways. So uh, revealing those uh, those class structures and, and those uh, old fashioned uh, silos that make up our society is definitely something that you, you see among those artists who are, who are dealing with uh, more social political issues. Um, I'd like to respond gently <laughs> to t take issue with one aspect of the of that question. What are the major socio-political themes that new generation artists are grappling with? Um, it seems to me that some of the th things that we've talked about, like for example, I talked about Ragnar Roka's daughter working with ocean salt and lava. I, that's not a romantic vision of nature. That's like working directly with um, a living landscape. And I can't, uh, I can't imagine something more significant in a socio-political sense right now uh, than art, artworks that are deeply and profoundly engaged and questioning of the relationship that humans have uh, with nature uh, based on millennia uh, of understanding that we are somehow separate from nature and that lords and masters of it all completely complete and total nonsense. Uh, and, and that's this kind of fallacious under, understanding is now is looking like not only ridiculous, but potentially lethal. So the, the, what what some of like so when Finboy Peterson um, that Tina talked about is making artworks that 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 utilize the sounds, the actual sounds of the of the earth. Uh, I think that's a profoundly socio political uh, approach. In in uh, I, 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 uh, in addition to many other elements of, of such a work, renegotiating our relationship uh, from a non-human centric perspective with nature, I think is like fundamental. And, 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 and I would just wonder why that's not done so much more in like my city of New, of New York. Why is that not much more, what, that should be a lot more prevalent in the art world here, in my opinion, not just on, uh, you know, not in. So I would just question that. Sep like what I'm perceiving as a separation between socio-political and nature, which I don't. I don't see any separation between the two at all. Does that make sense? I think you're 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 on the right track there. I, I, I it's a it's a very good point, Gregory, that you make, and and that uh, maybe many good contemporary artists in Iceland are doing exactly this. They are 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 helping us uh, experience. Uh, our environment in a different way and uh, we're turning the gaze from uh, you know us versus nature and i, I uh, didn't realize but the work i have here in the background i'm pointing it to it now is by one of those artists einar garibaldi i have to mention this since it's, since it's here with me einar garibaldi this is a sign that you would have typically on a, on a beautiful spot in nature saying you should stop your car here and you should watch this beautiful landscape this is an interesting place so this sign says this is an interesting place so Einar Garibaldi, in this case, went to Thinkvelli, which is our beautiful national park where you have gorgeous nature and, and, and important history. And he, in the, in, the, in the midst of night, he would go there and steal the sign <laughs> and put it up in the gallery saying, so here's Thinkvelli, voila. It's a isn't view that of like, isn't, it the, isn't that the site <laughs> of the ancient parliament? Yes, it is. But this is just one of the critiques that you see among among artists that we have to shift the focus from how we just gaze at nature as as, as being you know something to look at and be more a part of it. We have to cut out Precisely. the uh, images that we have in our minds and we have to relive it on our own uh, with our senses in our contemporary understanding of of this merger of man and nature. Right? Can I, I pull in one more? So and... oh, sorry. Sure. 
I was just gonna say, we're, we're getting really close to having um, to wrap this up. So I just wanted to pull in oh. one more question from the Q&A because I think it speaks, Gregory, to what you're, the, the question that you just posed about why aren't we seeing art like this in New York? So I wanted to talk a little bit about the art world in Iceland and specifically the way that artists are supported in Iceland. So Justin Levesque asked this question, can we speak to the ways socially and governmentally artists are supported in Iceland to create work and how this contributes to the way they might take more risks in their work? So um, I know when I was in Iceland, I learned about the pensions that are available for artists. And obviously they're not you know, universally available, but the fact that there are lifetime pensions that some artists can, can get um, is mind blowing. And so, you know, especially in the wake of NFTs, for example, we've been talking so much um, here in the States about uh, supporting artists or the lack of support for artists. And I have cited actually the pension system in Iceland saying, look, there is, a, you know, there are alternatives out there. There are, we can sort of broaden our horizons, open our imaginations. So be, yeah, Marcus, I would love to hear your thoughts on this question. Yeah, that's a good question from Justin. Uh, we're not exactly in Norway. We're not, you know, at the point where just everybody who says I'm an artist can just get a lifetime salary. But we have, a, the, it's a pretty good system and, and it's div divided into two, both of which are, are uh, on a, a competitive basis. You apply for your projects in one fund or you apply for your uh, monthly salary in another and you apply for a year or two years at a time and, and you get maybe three or six or nine months. So you're working on a specific project, you're going to a residency, you're going to focus on this uh, series of work uh, for, for a year and, and you get a salary, a monthly salary for that. So this, this, this two, this two uh, way system is, is pretty well functioning for the visual arts. We try to apply it to other arts, music, theater, and, uh, and the other fields of art. Um, and it obviously has a, has a very different connotation in different art forms, but for the visual arts, it, it works pretty well. And uh, I wouldn't say though that, uh, yeah, I, I don't think I, I'd say that the, the fact that you get your salary or your grants from a public uh, source would uh, keep you away from criticizing that source. I, I, I don't think that I've seen uh, any examples of that. Uh, people who want to critique, they do it uh, voluntarily and, and loudly on, on full sponsorship from the state. Okay, we only have like two minutes, but I want to, uh, in, in those two minutes, I want to respond to uh, one of the questions, but I can't respond in the way that I should because I don't know enough. But it's a question basically having to do with um, if, if new generation scholarship is being done on the Icelandic sagas from a position of feminist theory, critical race theory, and all this, this stuff. I can't talk about that um, because I simply don't know enough. However, I would really recommend to go to, I think, YouTube and find um, Joan Jonas, the great, great visionary Joan Jonas, uh, 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 her her work, Volcano Saga, because this work has everything to do with the Laxdaela Saga, uh, which some scholars suggest may have been written by a woman, but that's like really open to, to debate. But the, uh, the female roles in that saga are just so um, extraordinary, Gudrun being one of the great figures in, in this spectacular medieval literature of, of the sagas. So I think, I think that would be a good place to go. Uh, maybe also a good way for us to close this with one minute to go, because that's also ending with yet another visionary artist, Joan Jonas, pioneer of video art, pioneer of performance art, who's profoundly engaged and inspired by um, by Iceland and and by it and by its literature and by Haldor Laxness, who also is such a, a great author, uh, but who's who uh, Ragnar Kartensen uh, is in dialogue with. So I would really go to Joan Jonas Volcano Saga and watch the whole uh, watch the whole video. It's <laughs> her car gets blown off the road and. It's just absolutely fantastic modern Joan Jonas uh, interpretation of that great saga. Okay. That's true. That's true. It's a great work. So thank you, everybody. It's now four o'clock Eastern Standard Time. I'm going to go to Reykjavik in like two weeks. I can't wait to go. <laughs> Enough about me. Next series will be on art in America. 
<laughs> what what is no, that, the typical artist in America doing? <laughs> yeah, that's actually well, they are. That's I mean, it's too that, that's too complicated to say what typical artists are doing. However, I last I know it's we're a little, but I mean, these are one thing I have totally experienced in Iceland cross generations, younger ones and older ones is that in some manner artists tend to be engaged in a profound way with their homeland, whatever that means, nature, history, identity, uh, anger, uh, uh, complex things, but that it tends to, tends to be. There's a great group of artists who have worked together for a long time called the Icelandic Love Corporation. I, I love them, all women, they they do, it's so excellent. Look at Rodnir Kjartansson's work. He's invoking specifically Icelandic things, also making fun of them as well. Sigurd R. Goodmanson as well, who should be like a household figure in the West, but is not the early work I'm talking about from some generation time. I think we definitely need the sequel to this talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're just starting naming names here and what, what happens next. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us today. And I think we're going to stick to the hour. So, and we will repeat this at some point, I think. Wonderful. But, okay. Thank you thanks so, much so much for, for the being opportunity. Here. Okay. Bye. Have a nice bye. Bye. Day. Bye.